This is the Mediterranean, Homer's wine-dark sea. Odysseus was storm-tossed here. Here rode the galleys. Above this inland sea loomed the promontories, the earth of Greece and Rome, their gods and laws. Go down into that water. This blue-green ambience, rippling into depths, stands well for an image of time. Here, in time's waters, recover the lost features. Amphora of dead gods and kings. Ships and sunken cities. Porches and columns of Rome. Stranger, which for Rome in Rome here seekest, and naught of Rome in Rome perceivest at all. These same old walls, old arches, which thou seest, old palaces, is that which Rome men call. Rome fell. Rome has never fallen. It lives, as we have heard in the words of Edmund Spencer, poet of the English Renaissance. Rome lives too in a modern play by the Irishman Bernard Shaw and in the powerful words of the German romantic poet Goethe. Speak, you stones, and you high palaces, speak! Eternal Rome, cease a while. Hear me. Hear, see Hear the service, quality, rank, and name of the Roman governor. By service, Caesar's shield. By quality, Caesar's friend. By rank, a Roman soldier. By name. Rufio! I, I am Caesar's shield. But what use shall I be when I'm no longer on Caesar's arm? <laughs> well, no matter. Apollodorus, Caesar. I leave the art of Egypt in your charge. Remember, Rome loves art and will encourage it ungrudgingly. I understand, Caesar. Rome will produce no art itself but will buy up and take away whatever the other nations produce. What? Rome produce no art? Is not peace an art? Is war not an art? Is government not an art? Is civilization not an art? All these we give you in exchange for a few ornaments. 
You will have the best of the bargain. Thus the Roman Julius Caesar, revived after 20 centuries by the Irish playwright Bernard Shaw. In such ways, in the imagination of poet and playwright, Rome lives forever. And it has a half-life as well, in its own records, in fragments of temples, palaces, arches. But what Rome was, what Rome meant to the culture of the West, what Rome means for us today, how to find answers to these questions. Rome's own poets and historians often give conflicting and pessimistic testimony. Lucretius, poet of Republican Rome in the first century before Christ, saw only a world going to pieces around him. In this way, the walls, too, of the great world around us shall be stormed and fall into decay and crumbling ruin. If it were the spirit of ancient Greece we were in search of, we might display it in architecture or in works of art which echo the boast of Pericles, leader of democratic Athens. We are the school of Hellas. The praise of the present and future is ours. We have forced sea and land to be the highway of our daring and everywhere have left imperishable monuments behind us. In these perfect works of art and architecture, man is enshrined forever in the strength and pride of youth, the wonder of Hellenic life. But the same cannot be said for the art and architecture of Rome. I understand, Caesar. Rome will produce no art itself, but it will buy up and take away whatever the other nations produce. Or Rome would simply take away, by right of conquest. Or it would copy what the other nations, particularly Greece, had produced. The German philosopher Hegel set Greece and Rome in this relationship. The joy of soul that existed in Athens, he wrote, gave way in Rome to harsh and rigorous toil. If we look on antiquity, on classical civilization as one, then Greece represents youth, perfection, joy, as in this birth of Venus from the fifth century before Christ. But from its earliest beginnings, in legends recorded by the Roman historians Tacitus and Livy, Roman strength was a somber strength. But the establishment of this great city was determined, I hold, by the fates. For when the brothers, Romulus and Remus, who were destined to found the city, were abandoned as infants, a she-wolf was attracted by their wail and very tenderly gave them suck. But at length, the kings of Rome grew arrogant, and Junius Brutus aroused the people to shut the gates forever against them. And thus, kingship ended at Rome. But the tiny republic, from the first, was threatened by fierce wars. War, as well as peace, has its laws. And we Romans of the Republic wage it with justice, as well as vigor. We conquer in the Roman way, by courage, effort, weapons. Stranger, what I say is short. Stay and read. Here is the unbeautiful grave of a beautiful woman. She loved her husband. She bore two sons. Her speech was gay, but her bearing seemly. She kept the home, she made the wool. 
I have spoken. Go away. I never learned Greek. I never wanted to. I did learn things far more useful to the Republic. To strike the enemy. To be vigilant on guard. To sleep on the ground. To fear nothing except this grace. Such are the images that early Republican Rome calls to mind. Discipline. Courage. Patriotism. But this early period of the Republic, from its inception 500 years before Christ, lasted for perhaps three centuries. Rome, as Rome, extended over 12 centuries. Conceive the time span. In the 5th century BC, with the Athenian Empire at its height, Rome was a backward city on the Tiber, a tribal kingdom endangered by its neighbors and the invading Gauls. 510 BC, the kings are expelled and Rome becomes a republic. 200 years later, and its legions were conquering most of Italy. A hundred years more, and Rome's great rival, Carthage, was destroyed, and the Roman unification of the Mediterranean had begun. A hundred more, and the political crisis of the Republic was thrusting ambitious men into conquest. Pompey in Africa and Asia, Julius Caesar in Gaul. 49 BC, Caesar crosses the Rubicon with his army, the Republic falls, Caesar is assassinated, and Augustus finally takes over as the first emperor, the supreme ruler of the Roman world. But the empire never falters, even later under tyrants, Tiberius, Caligula, Nero. Under the better emperors who follow, Trajan, Hadrian, Marcus Aurelius, it reaches its greatest extent, an astonishing structure of roads, commerce, administration, culture, law. All these, as sure as Julius Caesar said, in exchange for a few ornaments. But conceive the cost, the problems and the temptations of world rule. Focus on the first age of crisis the corruption of the Republic. The houses of Pompeii help restore the background. Assume the year now to be 100 BC, the year of Julius Caesar's birth. The virtues of the early Republic, simplicity, frugality, are no longer in evidence. It is a time when the people are safe and at ease. Slaves, perform the hard labor. Wealth pours into Rome from the conquered nations. And the signs and symbols of wealth, the few ornaments, are proudly displayed in the luxurious villas. Greek statues bought up or looted or copied. On the walls of the houses, delicate paintings by Greek artists or their imitators. In such an environment, the words of the earlier Republican, the Consul Marius, have an odd ring. They say I'm vulgar because I cannot give a dainty dinner. I am happy to admit the charge. From my father, I learned that daintiness is appropriate to women, strenuousness to men that the only true ornaments are not art or furniture, but weapons. War and celebrations of war are still part of the Roman scene. But in the first half of the first century before Christ, in Caesar's time, Rome was no longer threatened by its neighbors. Rome threatened and conquered. Thank mm -hmm. you.
War and celebrations of war. And as in all periods of Roman history, the conquering generals returned to the city and the glories of a triumph. Trumpeters led the advance. Then came the carts, laden with the spoils of war. The defeated kings and princes wearing golden chains. Then, robed in purple, the victorious general. Triumph was the greatest reward a Roman general could be given. But triumphal arches symbolized more than a mere conquest of territories. Along with the Roman legions went Roman civilization, bringing Roman laws to lawless tribes. Roman military power for hundreds of years was invincible. But wherever it prevailed, an idea was planted. The idea of a world community uniting all men of all nationalities, all races. But what of Rome itself, center of the enormous empire? Some 60 years before the birth of Christ, in the words of the historian Sallust, Rome has become a sink into which there pours all who are in any way notorious for vice. Vice and corruption there was, Undoubtedly. But what is most impressive through all the corruption was the force of the individual moral struggle. Intimate records of the late Republican age reveal it best. In art, the portrait busts, Rome's most original artistic contribution. These realistic heads often made from life masks or death masks, yet they're not merely records of facial warts and wrinkles. They reveal a dark intimacy in which we trace the warfare in the Roman soul. Listen to the famous orator and statesman Cicero, whose pious maxims inspired generations of English schoolboys. The short period of life is long enough for living well and honorably. But Cicero's private letters reveal a deeply troubled man. In these letters, he traces the death throes of the Republic. Yes, Caesar! The bid for political power by Julius Caesar. Shaw's portrait of Caesar shows a confident man, beneficent to Rome's subject nations. Cicero's letters reveal another Caesar. Caesar has been seeking for absolute power. It has not been his aim to make the Republic happy and virtuous. We could not possibly be more wretched, more disgraced than we are. We are the slaves of Caesar, and he of circumstances. Julius Caesar gained absolute power only to fall in 44 BC to the daggers of the conspirators. Let Shakespeare now show us an intimate picture of the forces of violence at large in Roman society after Caesar's assassination. Here we see Caesar's heir, the 18-year-old Octavius, the old soldier Lepidus, and Mark Antony. These many then shall die. Their names are pricked. Your brother too must die. Consent to Lepidus. I do consent. Prick him down, Antony. Upon condition, Publius shall not live, who is your sister's son, Mark Antony. He shall not live. Look for the spot, I damn them. But Lepidus, go you to Caesar's house. Fetch a will hither, and we shall determine how to cut off some charge in legacy. Shall I find?
find you here? Or here, or at the Capitol. This is a slight, unmeritable man. Meet to be sent on errands. Is it fit the threefold world divided? He should stand, one of the three, to share it? So you thought him? And took his voice, who should be pricked to die in our black sentence and prescription? Octavius, I've seen more days than you. Though we lay these honours on this man, to ease ourselves of divers slanderous loads, he shall but bear them as the ass bears gold, to groan and sweat under the business, either led or driven as we point the way. And having brought our treasure where we will, then take we down his load and turn him off, like to the empty ass, to shake his ears and graze in commons. You may do your will, but he's a tried and valiant soldier. So is my horse, Octavius. And for that I do appoint him store of provender. From this conference, Cicero too was to lose his life, for he had trusted Octavius. Octavius' double dealing is well documented by the biographer Plutarch. For now, Octavius, though a mere youth, persuaded Cicero to join him in procuring the goodwill of the Senate. And thus Cicero ruined himself and betrayed the liberty of his country. For Octavius, once in power, bade Cicero farewell. May it be mine to build firm and lasting foundations for the government of Rome, taking with me when I die the hope that these foundations will endure. The speaker is that same mere youth, Octavius. Systematically, ruthlessly, he had, by the age of 32, removed his rivals to become the Emperor Augustus absolute ruler of the civilized world. It was a world longing for peace. In less than 20 years, Rome had suffered three civil wars. And to Virgil, Rome's greatest poet, Augustus was the man, the leader so often promised, who would bring peace to Rome at last. And in this Virgilian work of art, Augustus, altar of peace, we find a counterpart to Virgil's poetic vision, a vision of harmonious rule under law. Rome, that glorious city, will bound her power by earth, her pride by heaven. These are Julia's children, the son of a god, Augustus Caesar, founder of a new age of gold. Others, no doubt, will better mold the bronze to the semblance of soft breathing, draw from marble the living countenance, and others plead with greater eloquence, or learn to measure better than we the pathways of the heaven, the rising of the stars. Remember, Roman, to rule the people under law, to establish the way of peace, your fine arts, these forever. To spare the humble and ward out the proud. Augustus' reign was to last 45 years, 31 years before the birth of Christ, 14 after, and has become known in history as Rome's golden age. When I was 19, I collected an army on my own account and at my own expense, by the help of which I restored the Republic to liberty. I constructed the Flaminian Road. I built the Temple of Apollo. I found Rome a city of brick and transformed it into a city of marble. I cleared the sea of pirates. I extended the frontiers of all the provinces of the Roman people, for which good services on my part, I was by decree of the Senate called the name 
Augustus. Hail Thus Augustus, the emperor, and the account of his reign. The historian Tacitus gives a slightly different version. With equality gone, all looked to the emperor's bidding. A few spoke of the blessings of freedom in vain. More feared war, and some desired it. But the fact is that Augustus brought peace, not war, to the Roman world. A peace that lasted for 200 years, the Pax Romana. His foundations for the government of Rome were to last even through a succession of ruthless, power-mad emperors. The historian Suetonius here documents a random selection of those emperors. So much for Caligula the emperor. The rest of this history must needs deal with Caligula the monster. I have separated this catalogue of Nero's less atrocious acts from the others, but I must begin now to list his crimes. Once, when Caracalla was visiting his mother, he stabbed his brother in his mother's arms. There were Caligula, Nero, Caracalla, but there were also the so-called good emperors, Trajan, Hadrian, whose country villa this was, and above all, there was Marcus Aurelius, emperor and philosopher. From his early youth, Marcus Aurelius had been schooled in the tenets of Stoic philosophy. Perform each task from hour to hour, as though it were to be the last. His equestrian statue still stands in Rome, returning the salute of legions which have been dust for 2,000 years. As emperor, he fought on the frontiers in a vain attempt to consolidate the threatened empire and pardoned conquered enemies. As a philosopher, after a day's march or a day's fighting, he wrote down in Greek his meditations, in which he expressed the ideal of Stoic philosophy, a vision of the unity of mankind. If there is a law common to all men, then we are all fellow citizens. If this is so, we are all members of some political community. And if this is so, then the world is, in a manner, a state.